Hello and welcome to this episode of Build Your AutoCAD IQ. On today's edition, tips and tricks, productivity tips and tricks, we're going to be talking um, about user interface tips, editing commands to speed up productivity, keyboard shortcuts, and some more advanced tools in AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT. Hello, my name is Alex. I'm an Auto desk technical support specialist based at the Boston office. I'm actually joined in the room by Ashley and Victoria, who are also technical support specialists. And we got our one odd man out, Ryan, who's uh, also joining us, but he's way out west in uh, Lake Oswego, Oregon. And as always, we're joined by Nauman, our expert elite. He'll be hanging out with you guys in the chat. Uh, before we get going, let's just do some clerical stuff. Um, as you guys know, you can leave your questions at any time in the chat. We do everything we can to, to get to them all. Um, you got access to all the links that are available in this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Everything will be sent to you um, afterwards as well for reference. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, um, but I guess the one point uh, to note is that uh, Thanksgiving here in the States, November 24th, there's not going to be a webinar. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind if you're if you're going to be around that week. We won't, sorry. Also, a couple of other cool links here to check out. Um, and always, if you want to join our customer council, um, we got the emails to do that here. Also, when you guys get a chance, always uh, scope out our, our Autodesk Knowledge Network, our AKN. Uh, if it's something that you haven't been to in a while, please go check it out. Things are constantly being added to the uh, AKN network. And uh, so yeah, just uh, keep, keep that in mind and, and always feel free to reference that. So this week's agenda, we're going to be going over some helpful settings and customization in CAD and LT, some hints for dynamic blocks, um, some real cool tricks on keeping drawings clean, and you'll see that one of these is not like the other. Um, I'll be talking about uh, integrating some satellite and or road imagery into your models to kind of help build some context. So before we jump into things, let's do some polls. The first poll is, is this your first Autodesk help webinar? And we're just going to leave this open for a little bit. And it looks like votes are still coming in. So, all right, let's go close that out. What do we got here? So it looks like a vast majority of no, this is not your first, um, but we do see that there are some, so welcome. All right, let's run one more poll. Which AutoCAD-based application do you use? We got CAD, LT, uh, architecture, MEP, and some verticals. Let's see what we got. Keep this open for a little longer. All right, we got 75% of the votes in. All right, let's go ahead and close this out. What do we got? So, all right, most of us uh, today are, are using CAD and LT, and we got some verticals as well. All right, so I'm going to hand this off to Ashley. So, Ashley, why don't you, why don't you take it from here? All right, thanks, Alex. So I'm just going to make myself the presenter here. And let me know you can see my screen. Perfect. All right. So the first thing that we're going to talk about are how to use hyperlinks. So hyperlinks are very useful to provide information about your objects. They can be pointed to a manufacturer website, to a Word document that contains an installation procedure, or to an Excel file that contains um, product specifications. You can also add hyperlinks to any object. And I'm going to show you how to do that now. So if we go over to the, um, the Inserts tab here, we have the Data Panel. And in the Data Panel, we have the hyperlink option. So it's going to prompt us to select our objects. We select our object. And then a dialog box is going to pop up where we can actually add the specific URL or um, 
you can add anything you like. So for just as an example, I'm going to add the, um, the Autodesk. And Some people are you, saying that your audio is a little low. Would you mind increasing it somehow? Sure. Is it better? Is it better now? Uh, still soft, but uh, if you can't, yeah. Okay. I'll try to talk a little bit louder. Oh, so that's if, better. It's better? Okay, perfect. Um, so if we hover our mouse over our object, we'll see here a little dialog box where if we press Control and then the object, it'll link us right to our um, website. So that's how to use hyperlinks. So if we want to save our settings to an external location, in Windows, utilities for importing and exporting AutoCAD settings are in the Start menu here. So if we go to All Programs and we go to Autodesk, we have AutoCAD here. And then if we select Migrate Custom Settings, it's going to give us two options here. So the first option is export, which is going to save a zip file with your settings. The import option lets you pick the zip directly without extracting or locating any files within it. Use this option to import the settings into a new or existing installation of AutoCAD on either the same or, if you'd like, a, a different computer. This is really useful if something happens to your user interface in AutoCAD and you need to, um, to restore it. One thing to, to note is that in order for the migration to be successful, the language of AutoCAD versions has to be the same. So for example, you can't export settings from an English version of AutoCAD and then import them into a um, German version, for example. Um, one of the most powerful shortcuts in AutoCAD are command aliases. So, for example, you just have to type L and then enter to activate the line command or C for circle. Um, so, one thing that we can do is if you're using another product and use command aliases that you'd also like to use in AutoCAD, um, you can absolutely do that. And I'll show you how you, um, how you can. So here we have um, Express Tools, and if we select Command Aliases, it's going to open this dialog, um, the, the editor dialog box, and we have the aliases on the left, and then the AutoCAD commands on the right. So let's say I want to change um, the delete alias. I select Edit, and that's going to pop up another dialog box where I, can, where I can rename that. So let's say, for example, I want that to be called AA. So I'll select OK. It's already being used for the area command, but I want to redefine it, so I'm going to select Yes. So now, if I type in AA, you'll notice that it still refers to the area command. So I'm not sure how many people have come across this before, but um, the, it did not actually complete the, um, the command. And the reason why is because the dialog box is actually at the bottom of our screen here. So that can happen from time to time, just to be aware of it. So in order for us for these um, changes to actually be applied, we want to select Apply, and then OK. And now, if we type in our alias here, AA now refers to the, um, the Erase command. And for those of you that are using AutoCAD LT, you can access the Alias Editor in the Manage tab and select Edit Aliases. But remember that the changes will not take effect until you close and reopen AutoCAD. So that's, a, that's an important difference if you're using um, LT. Another cool thing that I'm going to show you is um, how to um, pin open to expand a tab. So if we're in the Annotation tab here and we want to leave this open, we can select this little um, thumbtack here, which is in the left um, corner. And that tab is going to stay open while we're, doing, um, while we're doing work here. And you can do it with a number of different tabs. The only thing to remember, though, with this is that it only applies while the ribbon is um, current. So if you change, you're going to have to reopen and, and pin those open again. But it is certainly a very handy tool to have to avoid too many clicks. So another thing that we can do is we can actually make our ribbon panels sticky. So what does that mean exactly? It means that we can tear off a ribbon um, panel to the, to the drawing area. 
And it's going to say in here, you know, even if we change um, change tabs, the nice thing is that it's still going to remain in our um, in our drawing area, much like a toolbar would. Um, if you want to return these, and you can either, if you have a really great memory, you know where they go, you can just drag and drop them. But you know, for me, I prefer this way because I have no idea sometimes when I have so many in the drawing area where to put them. So I we simply um, select this. Uh, icon right here, and it's going to return them exactly where they need to go without having to to remember exactly where they where they were. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you is um, how to maximize drawing real estate, and with that, we can use the clean screen mode. So to do that, we're going to press Control plus zero, and that's going to um, that's going to bring in our um, our clean screen mode for us. We can also um, we can also change that um, again by simply selecting Control plus zero, and it's going to return us um, to how we were before. And you can also control that down here in the right-hand corner um, by using this um, that icon there. And one of the last things that I'm going to show you here today is how we can reduce our file size by using um, by using blocks. So. Let's say that we have user imagination here. We have a tree, and let's say that hundreds of lines um, make up this this tree. So one thing that we can do is we can turn it into a um, a, a block. We do that by in the block commands, and then we're going to type in um, the name here. We're gonna select our object, and now we've made that. Um, lovely tree into a block, which is um, then makes it really easy to duplicate if we like. We don't have to um, create those several hundred lines again. So, staying on the topic of blocks, uh, Victoria, I think I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, let me just take control of the screen here, and I will pick right back up where you left off. Okay. So we get a lot of questions about uh, dynamic blocks, and so I brought a few tips today to uh, help you get a little bit more proficient with um, dynamic blocks, some things that maybe um, you haven't encountered before or you've struggled with. Um, so here on the screen, I have the same data set that Ashley's working with, but I've created a few trees. I started one with the uh, that palm-looking tree that... Um, uh, that she's using. And um, one of the benefits to dynamic blocks is um, if you if you're doing um, if you're designing something and you decide, oh, you know, I want to swap all of these out, maybe they all need to be slightly different variations or um, species. Um, right now with the static block, you would have to replace that block with something completely different. Um, it's it's kind of cumbersome to go in and replace it with one of these individual blocks. So, what I've done here is created a dynamic block that can be um, toggled between uh, different styles. So you have maple, you have a, you know, the palm, and so I can quickly come in and, and customize each one of these individually, but they are part of the same block. Um, so you'll notice with this one, if I try to explode it, I get this error message down um, at the command line. One could not be exploded. So if you ever receive blocks from a uh, from a client um, or somebody else in your office, um, a lot of times people will uh, lock these blocks out because they don't want somebody going in and exploding everything down to its baseline work. Um, you can, but it, you know, sometimes there's a need for that. So if you need to do that, from the right-click menu here, open up your block editor, and inside the dynamic block, um, you can. Uh, you can get to the properties here. Now you notice I haven't selected anything. Um, and a lot of people's first instinct is to come in and start selecting whatever whatever you're trying to show or, or adjust. Um, but there are some properties inherent in the block that show up in the properties palette when nothing is selected. Uh, so from here, I'm just going to minimize a couple of these. And I think the reason that they're overlooked occasionally is because it is buried below the, um, you know, you have to scroll in the properties palette to get to it. Um, so there's this block option here that's got a bunch of properties that are um, associated with this dynamic block. 
Uh, one of those is allow exploding. So if this is set to no, then you can't explode the block. But if you need to explode it for some reason, you come in, toggle this to yes, and you'll be able to explode the block. Now while we're here, there are a couple of other things that you might notice uh, that are handy. Um, if you have an annotated block and you don't want it to be annotated, or vice versa, you want to make it annotative so that it adjusts as you adjust your scale, you can change the annotation, yes or no. Um, you can match the orientation um, to the layout. You can scale the block uniformly. So if you only want the, the if you want the block to scale uniformly in all three axes, um, instead of being able to individually scale, maybe if you have a table, you might want it to be able to be scaled separately on the x axis, but not the y. Um, oh, sorry, separately on the X and Y axes. Uh, you can toggle that here as well. Um, and if you're working in different drawing units, you can change the units within the block. So you don't have to go back in and um, explode everything and redraw your block from scratch just because you're working in Imperial and the block happens to be in metric units. Um, or you're working in feet and you need it to be drawn in inches. So you can come in and change this here. All right, so from here, um, let's see. Let's say we want to remove these pieces here, but we're not sure, we're not sure. Um, we don't want to just save the changes and have to come back and undo a whole lot of different things. Um, what you can do from within the block is to test it, and there's this test block here. Um, and if you enter the test block environment, I'm just going to zoom to it here. Uh, you can test the visibility. So, you know, maple. Oh, I'm missing one for oak, right? So maybe I, I know that I need to come back in and adjust this, um, but I'm happy that the text isn't showing up anymore. From here, I can close the test block, and I'm still in the block editor. So it lets you quickly go back and forth between making edits and testing your block without having to save it and close it and reopen it in the block editor. Um, so the next tip here is about visibility states. Now you'll notice that I've added a visibility state to this block, and I have a bunch of different um, a bunch of different blocks, uh, tree shaped blocks, nested within here. Um, up here on the ribbon, you have your visibility states manager, and that'll show you your different visibility states, and you can set them current or um, move them around, rearrange them, rename them, uh, delete them. But if you don't want to open that up. Um, you have them set up the way you want. You can see everything by toggling this icon, the visibility mode or BV mode, on, and then it shows you, kind of grayed out in the background there, all of the other uh, visibility states that are not set current. The brightest green one is the current visibility state. Um, so if I wanted to add, say, um, let's say I go to Oak, and I've figure out that I, you know, I want to add something here just to this visibility state. Um, I can add, you know, I can insert this block here and say, okay, I want, um, I want one of my, maybe this tree here, um, and I'll insert it at, what, zero, zero. So it's here now, um, but maybe I want this to show up on all of the different visibility states. Now I could go through, make one current, you know, and, and use the buttons up here to um, make it visible or make it invisible and really um, do a lot of jumping around and clicking. Or from here, you can right click that object or a series of objects. Um, maybe you want to associate, um, here's a better example, maybe you want a, line a linear parameter, right, and you want the distance. Maybe we want this to be on all of these different visibility layers, or these visibility states, but I only put it in, in the one. Um, I can right click on this from here and adjust that visibility really quickly. I can hide it from the current state or show it for just the current state, or I can hide it for all states, or in this instance I want to show that distance parameter in all the different states. So I'll click on it and it'll show up now in Maple, in pine, that sort of thing. Okay, so from here I'm just going to 
delete that and we'll close the block editor and I have one more tip to show you. Um, you can reset a block um, back to its defaults by right clicking on it and using the reset block command from the um, uh, from the right click menu. I think that's all I had. Uh, that block did reset from um, from the palm looking one to the pine tree so the and it's a pretty pine tree Victoria it is right <laughs> all right um, from here I'm just going to turn it over to Ryan and uh, you're going to pick up and show us how to clean up this mess we just made right oh it's perfect all right. nobody yeah. ever makes any drafting mistakes no, right no no we got it right the first time especially the attributes <laughs> <laughs> all right take it away all right So leaving off, or taking off where Victoria left off, I don't want to leave off. You can give it to Alex right away if he wants, but um, blocks, it's a good place to start. So there's a couple things to remember with blocks, just real quick before I jump into the main drawings. When you're checking blocks uh, for cleanliness in a drawing, if you're trying to verify properties or text or layers, colors, etc., just remember the fastest way to verify blocks, just open the properties. Uh, like Victoria was talking about with scales, names. If you're having trouble with block syncing or becoming accurate, just jump in and take a quick look and see. I mean, this is probably the, the most powerful tool for editing blocks is simply just properties. Um, from there, a couple of important things to remember when you're looking to get things back on track is colors. Uh, blocks follow a little different color uh, hierarchy, if you will, based on what the block objects are set to inside the block. So for example, if I wanted to override this block and make it red, I can currently do that, or I guess 237, 31, 36, which is a nice soft red. But if I want to change the layer, we got to look. So it's still set to by layer. So that's good. This is a good block. But what happens if we go into this block and we set these objects to, oh, here's why. So let me explain this a little bit. This is what I was getting at. So if we were to set these objects to by layer, then in block editor, these objects would be forced to take whatever layer they are on inside the drawing. So in here, if we go ahead and set this back to layer zero and try to change the color, if those objects are set to by layer, those colors do not change. And that holds true for line types and line weights. So one of the most important things to remember with blocks is setting the right object properties inside the block. So if you jump back in the block editor, we'll go ahead um, and set those properly. And those two schools of thought, you can set it to by layer if you want the layer to determine everything. I am under the impression that it should be set to by block. Uh, and this allows me greater control when I'm in the drawings. Oftentimes, you need to override one object. And so setting these to by block, it will take those settings. But it will also default to by layer unless those are overwritten. So if these are not overwritten, uh, it will remain to whatever the layer is set to. So if we set this to the building layer, and we go into, sorry, my layer is off screen. This is secret stuff I can't show you guys. Wait, here it is. So if we go to the building layer and we change this to center and hit OK, you can see that my block changed and it's still set to by layer. So by block allows you both by layer and by block setting. So to me, it's probably the best way of doing blocks. And that's up to you guys. It's just a neat little thing to remember with blocks. Um, also with blocks, there's a cool thing to remember. If you go ahead and name a block, and so you name that block wrong, or you open a drawing and the names are all kind of weird. Um, some of them are uppercase, some of them are lowercase, or you wanted to rename this block, you do not have to explode and reblock it. You can use a neat little tool called rename. So rename allows you to jump into the blocks, find the block you want to rename. So we'll go ahead and just rename Oak. And so you can find the block and you can change it here. So the old name refers to its current name. And this box down here is the new name. 
So if we wanted to then go ahead and change this to um, old oak, we could change it here and just hit rename to. You can see that the item screen refreshes. We'll go down and you can see that it now says old oak. So you don't want it to say that, you can go ahead and change it back to oak. And so now we can go back down and you can see that it says oak again. And so this holds true for layers and dimension styles, detail view styles, anything that really has a named style per se it can be renamed if you had named viewports, named views. So it's very powerful, very quick, and a good way to rename stuff. Uh, one other cool thing about it is if you have a, a series of objects that you want to rename globally and you want to put the same prefix on, so we can go ahead and put that here. If we grab both objects and go to old name, we can put, um, so for this instance, 4590, those are in my world, which is Plan 3D, those are called fittings. So I'm going to go ahead and call these fittings. And so in order to name them both with the fittings prefix, I need to actually add an asterisk or a star. So if I hit rename two, you can see that it threw fittings in front of both and kept the original block name at the back. So it's also very quick and, and pretty easy to rename your blocks when need be. So now diving a little bit away from where Victoria was at with blocks, we're just going to talk about general drawing cleanup. So one quick thing that I like to check when we get a drawing or I get a drawing here and customers are having trouble or even before Autodesk when I would get a drawing and it seemed to be just not running right or it was slow or whatever, the first thing I always do is zoom extents. So a double click with the mouse wheel or ZE and you can see that I got all my stuff way over here and if you look at the coordinates, we're very far away from zero, zero. So that usually means that something's really far from the drawing area. Depending on how much it is, it can be a big problem. If it's not very many things, you probably won't notice it unless you go to orbit or zoom or pan. It just, it's way out there. So the quickest thing I like to do is figure out what that is. And then since, since I grew, drew a very tiny circle at zero, zero. So because we don't need this, uh, we're going to go ahead and delete it. My recommendation is if you do need something that far away from your main drawing area, put it in the next ref. Uh, that will allow you to unload and load it when you need and to not bog down your main drawing when you're not needing that object that far away. So now that we're back at our main area here, uh, we're going to go through a couple, couple commands that are used to clean up drawings pretty quickly and efficiently. The first will be purge and then overkill and then audit followed by flatten. So purge, most of you probably are aware of purge. It allows you to purge out items that are not being used. It's important to remember purge does not purge out stuff that is being used. Um, it's one of those things that uh, we get asked that and it, it's, your stuff is safe as long as it's being used. If you went ahead and inserted a bunch of layers or blocks, um, but you didn't actually insert them, so you just hit insert, put the block in, and then it's deleted the geometry, you would still have those block definitions here. Uh, the same holds true for layers or dimension styles. If there's no objects that are using that particular style or layer name, they'll be removed. So if we don't want those objects, and we know we don't want all of them, go ahead and just hit purge all. So purge all will scan the drawing, and if you have zero length geometry enabled and purge orphan data, it will search the drawing for both of those. It's important to put nested items. That can be a pain. Um, zero length geometry is a big deal that can really slow down your drawing depending on how much there is. So in this drawing it mostly just found zero length geometry and empty text objects and it purged out about 17 objects. So if you're curious of things you can't purge, just switch over here and see. This will tell you basically everything that's in use. So layer zero and depth points cannot be purged. That's really good. Don't do that. That would be really bad. So these are all layers that are in play or in use. So if you're ever curious if something is still on a layer or a block is still being used, you can look here and just see, yes, you know, these blocks are still all being used. So from purge, we like to do what's called the dash purge, which is sort of a shortcut, but it allows a specific command, oh, not pudge, dash purge. Thanks AutoCAD for autocorrect. So if we go into dash purge, 
we can see the normal purge commands. Uh, we can purge independent stuff here if we just want to do blocks or just want to do materials. But we also have an additional menu called regapps. So regapps are registered applications that are normally used when you open AutoCAD in various different software, or AutoCAD drawings in various different software. It's an application that is registered under the drawing if objects were used or functions were used. Sometimes they can clog up the drawing. Uh, they vary from a couple in a drawing to several thousand. And depending on the computer or the type of applications, it can really slow your system down. So what we like to do is just go ahead and purge these out. And the main reason why is if you need those applications back, you won't even know that they were gone because you'll open it in whatever software you used and they'll be back. So go ahead and hit enter on the first screen. Uh, and I'll show that again just to explain it. So in dash purge, if we hit regapps, this is enter the name to be purged, or na name or names to purge. So if we don't know those, we just go ahead and hit enter. So the next one is verify each name to be purged. If you wanted to verify each registered application name, you'd go ahead and do that here. If you just want to get rid of them all, which personally I think you should just delete them all, uh, like I said, they'll, it'll, they'll be rebuilt if need be. And then we just go ahead and hit verify each name to be purged, no. So that went ahead, and if we hit F2, we can see in our command line that 12 registered applications were deleted. Uh, it'll list the name of the applications, and most of these make no sense unless you're super nerdy and like to code stuff. I'm not super nerdy, and I don't really like to code stuff, but I do like this. I do find some of these pretty interesting. So from dash purge, we're going to do what's called overkill. So overkill is going to take and uh, overwrite objects that are on top of each other. So the way overkill works is by selecting the objects that you want to actually scan. It doesn't select everything. You have to select everything to do that. So for this, we're just going to go ahead and select everything. Um, this is going to have a ton of different types of objects, blocks, um, you know, polylines, lines, points, text, all that kind of stuff. Uh, one important thing to remember is if you are trying to overkill or purge or anything, making sure that stuff is not on a locked layer. Anything on a locked layer will remain the way it was. Uh, it would be very hard to remove it when it's locked. So for this instance, we'll just keep it locked. Um, not a big deal. If you did want to go ahead and, and check those, you can just you know, open your layer manager, unlock the layers that you want to work on. Um, we'll leave those frozen. So um, it looks like we just had one layer locked, so I guess we'll just go ahead and go from there. So we'll select everything again. You can see that no locked layers were found down here. 5,995 objects found. I'm just hit enter. So that pulls up the overkill dialog box or delete duplicate objects. So the first thing we have is the tolerance. We can set this as high or low as we want. It's a good idea to leave it by default uh, unless you know you want to delete objects really close together. Uh, remember, 0.1 is an eighth of an inch, so anything within an eighth of an inch would get overwritten or du duplicated if it was. So if you had two lines parallel to each other within 0.1, uh, one of them would be removed. So the tolerance is good to set pretty high. This is incredibly high. Basically, objects only right on top of each other or the ends touching. Next, we can ignore certain properties. If we want to, say, uh, overwrite all blue and green objects on top of each other, we can ignore the color. Or uh, if you have layers 1 and 2, and you want to ignore those, so all objects that are duplicated on top of each other, one on layer 1, one on layer 2, this function would ignore that. And the same holds true for the rest of them. I tend to leave these settings on by default, up to my segments with polylines. This will make polylines out of objects that are end-to-end uh, -end and can be easily and cleanly created to a polyline. If you don't like polylines, just uncheck that. And then these three are very important to think about. Collinear objects that partially overlap. So if you have objects uh, with an endpoint that's near the midpoint of a line, and I can go ahead and show you that real quick too. Um, so if I had two objects, one line that was here, um, and then I went ahead and there was another line here. The collinear objects allow us to put these two objects as one object, even though they're not completely overlapping. And the second option 
determines it by endpoint. So if we have two lines that are end to end, overkill is going to actually turn these into one line. And so as we zoom back out, we go back into overkill, select all this, and we'll just hit OK. So we can see right off the bat that there was 18 duplicates deleted and 301 overlapping objects or segments deleted. So on a big scale, you'll get quite a few. On a small scale, you probably won't. And so I'll go ahead and show you the small scale again just so you can see up close what it's doing. So we'll go ahead and overkill these two lines that are end to end right here. We'll leave this on. So when we hit OK, you can see that nothing happened, which is good. So if we go ahead and rotate this guy and then do overkill, and we'll pick these two, we can see that one overlapping object or segment was deleted. So with the collinear option for endpoints turned on, it created one line. So if we went ahead and drew another line from here to here and did overkill again and pick these two, making sure to keep objects that partially overlap and it'll obviously get all overlapping objects. So we'll do that and one duplicate item was deleted. So the difference between overlaps and duplicates are items that are exact duplicates of one another on the exact same geometry or locations in AutoCAD or objects that just partially touch but are coincidental in plane. So uh, if I had an object that started near the midpoint and didn't quite touch this point right here, but was instead 0.02, overkill is not going to do anything with these. It's going to leave those as is because they exceed our tolerance level. So if we go ahead and do that, nothing's changed. So those are the important things to remember with the overkill. Uh, very powerful and very good for cleaning up line work. Uh, not so much blocks or 3D solids, but very good for 2D line work. From there, I'll go into two real quick before I jump this over to Alex. Uh, audit, it's a quick command. Um, it allows you just to audit the drawing and see if there are any errors. If the drawing is clean, there shouldn't be any. So we'll run audit. Um, I try to always fix the errors detected. Um, so we'll go ahead and run that, and it'll pass and scan every object in the drawing. Uh, you can see that it did two passes at 37,300 objects, um, and then it audited 434 blocks, and a total of zero arrows were found. So that's good. You can pat yourself on the back, no errors found. Or I can pat Ashley on the back because this is her drawing. Of course, I'm in Oregon, and she's in Boston, so that's not really possible. I'll have Alex pat her on the back. It'll totally work out great. So from here, the last thing that I like to check if I'm having issues with the drawing, dimensions aren't lining up, zoom and pan are kind of weird, it's still a little bit laggy. I try to always check if I'm drawing in, an object, in, a, in a drawing where there's just 2D line work, like this drawing here, that everything is on the same Z point. So typically if you're drawing in 2D line work and you're not needing to have elevation values, zero on the Z is perfect. It, it just allows you to have the best and cleanest drawings. So if you go ahead and just hit front, um, we'll use our cube, we'll hit the down arrow down here, or up arrow depending on how you feel about it. So this is going to take our drawing and point us pretty much flat at the drawing. So you can see right off the bat that there are some objects that just don't sit at the same point as everything else. So you can tell that this, these objects are actually, if you look down here at the coordinates or if I do a quick ID here, um, well, let me turn dynamic inputs on. So if we do a quick ID, you can see that those objects are actually 0.00000Z. So they're perfect Z, which is great. That's what I want. I don't like this stuff. So what do we do? Flatten it. I told Victoria, smush it, because it's way more intense sounding than flatten. So we're going to smush it, flatten it, although don't try to say smush too fast. And it's definitely not technical. So flatten. Totally technical. Thanks, Victoria. So we select everything with flatten, just like we did overkill. So with all objects selected, you can see 5,935 objects. A lot of those are going to have been removed from our duplicates, so we had a little bit more before. So the first thing you're prompted with is to remove hidden lines. So this is kind of a trial and error thing. Uh, if you want to see, if you're, especially if you're trying to flatten stuff for the sole purpose of making 3D stuff 2D. 
Uh, this is not technically 3D stuff. It's just stuff that got placed at the wrong elevation. So we want to go ahead and just say no, because I don't really want to remove any lines. That's the default value. So if you just hit enter, it'll go through no. Now it's going to scan every object I had selected. Uh, it sounds really intense. doesn't usually take very long, especially if it's just 2D line work. So it's going to scan all the blocks, lines, text, everything that's there, and it's going to go ahead and just smash it right to zero on the Z. So that's the important thing about flatten, is that we'll place everything zero Z. And so if you're not there, you will go there. So if you do move everything to the zero, zero, zero Z and you want to go back up to, say, 100 feet, you just select everything and move it up 100 feet. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind if you are trying to keep a specific Z value. Just remember that it will definitely push everything to zero. So we should be just about done with flatten here. It's also similar if you guys use 3D solids to the command flatshot. Uh, flatshot takes 3D solids and creates a 2D line work of it. So that's another command that somebody will have to go through someday. Because it's awesome. And probably more exciting than watching my mouse cursor spin in infinite circles. The good news is the cursor spins really fast if you watch it. It's kind of hypnotizing. So you won't get bored. You'll just fall asleep. I swear, it's almost done. Yeah, I this promise. Is, this is a pretty big data set to try flatten on. Um, <laughs> I know. If, you, if you do find this happening, though, it's you, only can, like 10 you items. can isolate some layers or something and try to... Yeah. That's important, too, is if you are trying to flatten everything, it, it will take as long as it takes. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, somebody in the chat window actually just said, in some cases, when flatten doesn't work, um, you can use the change command. Yeah, that is true, and you can change it to Z. Yep, exactly. Um, I've also used Quick Select to select the items that are not at the right Z elevation. My favorite which trick is for the, that is to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, so yeah, Quick Select works pretty well because you can just pick items. Um, you know, you can find an item, and if it's not on Z, so if you had text that was floating, or um, if you had a line that in, in does not equal zero, um, on the Z or start, if you can narrow down it might find just the items that are not on Z, which, you know, if you don't want to flatten everything, that's a good thing to find. But what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say, if you find that it doesn't seem like it's actually going to zero, but it displays in properties, mm -hmm. you can always adjust the, um, uh, the decimal places in the units of your drawing, um, mm -hmm. or the, the precision, rather to something really yeah. like, yeah, you have yours out to four decimal places, but if you only have it to one yeah. or two, it might look like it's zero, but it's yeah. really just a rounding error. I'm super accurate, Victoria. If I could go 20 decimal places, I would. So you can see that some items didn't actually flatten. And why that is, it's really depending upon the type of item. Some items are pretty pretty reluctant to do so. Um, a lot of it's just the way that the geometry works. Uh, if the layer's locked, uh, those sort of things are really important too because they they can resist being moved or adjusted if that's the case. So that's when you go ahead and just pick those items and move them to zero Z. So if we pick these polylines, we can see that the elevation is at 75. If we just hit zero, it drops them down real quick. So if we have uh, these text objects, text is a little bit weird. And the reason is, is because it doesn't necessarily look for the same it, uh, data entries, so text alignment and elevation may not fall under the same uh, nomenclature that lines or polylines use. So again, if you just hit zero, it'll drag those down. And so we can go ahead and do that real quick to these last objects. Let's see what we have: arc and a polyline, um, center Z on the arc, and the polyline is also an elevation function. So that's a quick way to do. Uh, most objects, like I said, a few objects will not flatten. So if you just go ahead and look at them independently or you do a quick select um, and see which ones are not there, it's pretty easy if you change to your front view to see what's not on zero as well.
So with that, I'm going to go ahead and give it to Alex, and he's going to blow everybody's mind and talk about satellite imagery and put us all to shame. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks, Ryan. That was pretty cool. I'm just going to grab the screen. You can see it? Awesome. All right, so today I'm going to show you this pretty cool functionality in CAD and CAD LT where we have the opportunity to access the Microsoft Bing servers to add satellite and or road information to, to help give more meaning and context to our file. So we're actually going to be taking the same file that uh, we've been looking at all, uh, all this uh, session. And what I want to point out before we get going here is that we are going to be making use of very specific coordinate systems. However, it's important to note that we're not actually geo-referencing this DWG file. So once you've gone through this whole process that I'll show you momentarily, and say eventually you want to send this out to someone that's working in Math 3D or Civil 3D, it's probably not going to drop in to whatever coordinate system that those people are using. So it's, I just really want to reiterate that, that we're not actually geo-referencing this file. That's not a bad thing, though, because in CAD and in LT, if you guys are doing your drafting or designing somewhere closer to 0, 0, we can still bring in those satellite imageries that have those known coordinate systems to wherever it is you need it to go. So it's pretty cool. We don't really need to be worried about making our designs or whatever way out and, you know, 100,000 east by 10,000 north. We could just kind of keep things under control closer towards the origin. Before we gain access to anything, you want to make sure that you guys are logged into your A360 account from within AutoCAD. Without doing that, we're not going to be able to make a connection to the, the Microsoft Bing server. But once we've done that, we're logged in, we're going to type in the geo command. And this is fantastic. Uh, the geo command is actually the short version of geographic location. You have your choice, but man, <laughs> if I had to remember geographic location or try typing that in every time I wanted to use it, I'd get pretty frustrated. So we could just use the geo command. Once we've done that, we got two options. We got map and file. And if I went down and I selected file, I'll have the opportunity to bring in either a KML or a KMZ file. For example, say you guys are, are doing something in, in Google Earth and you have a, a geographic marker location and you save that out, invariably it would be in one of these two formats. So if we have a known location that we want to reference in Google Earth, we, we have the ability to do that. I'm just going to type in geo again because I want to show you how we do this directly from the Bing server. The other option is map. If I click on that, yes, do you want to access the online maps? Hit yes. We're going to be presented with this nice fancy image of the Earth. Now from here we kind of have, we, we need to have a sense of where we are roughly. Um, again, if you're in Google Earth or some other mapping software and you have a sense of your latitude and longitude, you can enter that here. But even better, if we know roughly where we are, and in this case we are in Nashua, New Hampshire, on Broad Street, we're going to get zoomed in to this one location from here. So once we're here we kind of have to do some investigating especially if we don't have a specific known address, like a home address. But I do know that over here is our site. If I move this over, you can kind of see what that looks like. This looks pretty much like what we need. So I'm going to zoom in over here, and yep, that, that's what we want. Over on the left here, you see this Drop Marker Here button. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And what that's going to do is from my original point of reference, it's going to drop this little red pin. And this is known as my geographic marker location. This is the pin 
that is going to make the correlation between these satellite images that have that coordinate system associated with it to wherever I want in my DWG file. It's not in the right spot. I have nowhere on my DWG to, to actually know where this pin is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it. I'm going to grab the marker point and I'm going to move it. Let's say somewhere within reason that we can kind of easily identify on our DWG. I'm going to zoom in. Let's take the pictures mount. This is not going to be survey grade, guys. I, we don't have the ability to do that. My finger is way too fidgety to actually drop something on a very precise coordinate system. But we can approximate where it's going to be. So I'm going to put it on that pictures mound. I'm going to hit next. And this is going to kick me into the available coordinate systems for this available imagery from Bing. We've got a whole long list of things. Uh, but essentially, you want to try to grab a coordinate system that is within reason. You can see I got some New Hampshire ones, I got Massachusetts and some more global geodetic coordinate systems. I want to pick something that is close to the site because I might have these reprojection issues if I take, for example, the Antarctic coordinate system. Uh, it might look a little wonky when we try to bring it into National New Hampshire because they're, right, they're not right next to each other. We also have the opportunity here to identify whether the coordinate system we want to use is going to be in feet or meters. So I'm going to take, uh, let's take, I think I'll take the uh, New Hampshire NAT83 feet. You see up here, once I click on it, it's going to assign that. I'm going to hit next. And then from here, we want to specify where on the DWG file we established that geographic marker location in the previous step. So I grabbed home plate. I'm going to click on that. And it's going to ask me, well, where do I want north? Well, generally speaking, we'll, we'll assume that north is straight up. So I'm going to click north and I'm going to enter. And you'll see that our satellite imagery has now been added to our DWG file. Hmm, something doesn't look right here. I think I might have accidentally grabbed the wrong pictures mound. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go back in, whoops, and over here, you'll notice that once I brought in that Bing satellite imagery, we got a new tab, the geolocation tab. And from over here, we have a whole lot of options, my first one being edit location. So I can go back in and I can change where I have that geographic marker location. So I'm actually going to move it over to this home plate. Zoom in, it looks a little bit better. Hit next. I'm going to keep the coordinate system I already have established. And it's going to ask me again where I want that location. I've already selected it in the previous step, so I'm going to just enter all the way out. And it's going to shift the location of that satellite imagery. So now, it looks a lot better. Things are lining up. We can see that we got the track here. So this is looking pretty good. So if you made a mistake in that step, don't worry. You can always edit that location. You can also edit the north. For this example, it was pretty convenient. Uh, you know, we, we had north as being directly up. But we can reorient north if we wanted to, and that's going to rotate everything. If I decided, uh, really, I just don't want to have any satellite imagery, I can remove the geographic marker location. I'm not going to do that. But essentially, that would just disassociate any connection to the Bing server for this particular DWG file. I have the ability to add markers. Um, we can enter it by lat long. Some internal um, devices have, a, or some devices rather have an internal GPS system that we can leverage if it's activated and identify where we are. Um, but this one here, points, is pretty cool to show. If I go ahead and just make a point, if I take a look at its properties, you'll see that I'll have the local coordinate systems as, long, as well as the, um, the geographic or geodetic coordinate system. So we, we have that ability to extract the, the actual New Hampshire coordinate system information if we needed it. Over here, 
under online map, we can change what we're looking at between aerial or road map. And you'll see that the it's kind of looking at Google Earth. You can kind of switch in between. We could do a hybrid if we wanted, or we could even just turn it off. This is cool. We can turn it off but still have the connection to those Bing servers. So for you know, doing work and you don't want to be bothered with the uh, satellite imagery, we could just turn it off, but we're still connected to it. So that's pretty cool and handy. Now the one thing is we are not allowed to print directly from the big server. It's not possible. So if I went to a layout, you'll see, even though I have that satellite imagery in my model space, it's not in the layout and it's not visible in my viewport. What I can do is I can take a capture of the satellite imagery. I got two options. I can do it by what's available in my viewport or in my view, and the other one is by capture area, so I could kind of just create a window. And that's going to take a snapshot of that from the Bing server, and we'll be able to leverage that and use it in our plotting. You'll see it'll add the logo, um, but it's great that we will be able to use that and, and again, help add meaning and context to what it is we're trying to present. The one thing to note is that whatever you capture will be by whatever resolution is currently being streamed from the Bing server. So as we're zooming in and out and panning, we're always talking to that Bing server. We're always getting a refresh of what imagery is available for that zoom extent. So you just got to keep that in mind. Um, you can, if you tag it, you can reload just going to go through this quickly because we're running out of time, but you can reload the resolution, but that initial capture will be whatever current resolution was being streamed from the Bing server. So we only have a couple minutes. Um, I think I'm going to end it there. Just wanted to give you this brief introduction to, to leveraging the, the Microsoft server. So I'm going to end it here and kind of go through. We did see this in CAD. In the uh, PowerPoint deck that we'll be sending out to you guys, we have a whole lot of resources available for you guys. As always, we appreciate any feedback you guys have. Um, you know, the, the more feedback we get, the better this experience will be for you. And we are at the very top of the hour. Um, we don't have real time for questions, but again, please let us know. What oh, we have time for one question. Victoria, do you want me to pass it over to you? Uh, no, you don't need to pass it over to me, but um, the question was actually about Google Maps versus Bing Maps. Can we use uh, Google Maps instead of Bing Maps? Great question, and the answer is no. We, we currently have an agreement with Microsoft to, to access their satellite imagery. Um, we did used to have an agreement with Google. Um, I think it was back in 2013 was the last release of Map 3D that I'm aware of that um, we were able to leverage um, Google, but at this point we only have an agreement with Microsoft to access those. So short answer, no, sorry. All right, guys. Well, hey, it was a pleasure. Hope to, uh, oh, one last poll, one last poll before I totally forget. I keep forgetting this. We'll do it. Uh, did you learn something? Hopefully you did. Went through a lot of really cool functionality and tips and tricks. Let this run. I know I learned a lot. All right, let's close this out. So wow, 99% of you did learn something. So super glad to, to hear that. And um, again, it was a pleasure talking with you guys and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next uh, Build Your AutoCAD IQ.